Now to something almost completely different. Bluetooth. So what was the idea many years ago? Well, the idea was how can we basically replace wires? We need wires between headsets and a mobile phone. We need wires between a computer and a mobile phone at these times. Or we used infrared. Infrared data association. So that was a standard where you could use infrared light to exchange data. Well, that's also you have to direct the devices so they see each other, etc. Mm, also not an ideal solution. So how can we connect computers, peripherals, personal digital assistants at that time, the newest devices, cell phones, without a wire, without using infrared? Plus, if we have such a system, it must be cheap, extremely cheap. Wireless LAN at these times, it was too expensive. We don't need high data rates. We don't need to cover long distances, but we need low power consumptions. We want to use license-free ISM band as the wireless LANs. We also want to support voice because we want to support headsets, for example. So the idea was, well, one megabit per second, that's fine. That can do it. And you see here a picture of one of the first modules from Ericsson. Okay, that was the basic idea. This all happened 1994 at Ericsson, when two people, well, they were the major drivers, had the so-called MC-Link project. And uh, during a meeting they had uh, with some friends, they came up uh, with this new name, renaming Bluetooth, according to Harald Blotand, Blotand the by name of Harald Gormsen, the son of Gorm, it was the king of Denmark in the 10th century. I'll give some more historical background in a second. And this is what the original logo also showed. These were the sails of the Viking ships sailing on the open sea. Okay, then there was the foundation of the Bluetooth interest group. There was a funny fact, a rune stone uh, showing this event. Well, there was already first consumer products for the mass market around 2000, 2001, 2005, 5 million chips per week. Quite a lot. The special interest group had five initial founding members and now many thousands more. And uh, going to the special interest group, you will find the specification, etc. Uh, they do the certification of products and today the core specification comprises more than 3,200 pages. So yes, it started as a very simple replacement for cables, but today it's quite complex. I will come back to this on some of the slides. Okay, you also see the change of the logos from the initial one to the new one and the newest one. Well, just detour in history. Stop the video if you want to read this. So that's a picture of the rune stones at Ericsson 1999. And they raised this rune stone in memory of Harald Blotand. So Harald Gormsen and the by name was Blotand. And who was this guy? Well, definitely at these times he didn't have a cell phone, but uh, that's the real rune stone. So uh, and that's in Denmark and uh, this was erected by this King Harald, was called Blotand and saying, okay, uh, this was the guy bringing together the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, and so, and that was the idea that also Bluetooth brings together technologies. Just by the way, only because Blå today means blue in Swedish, Blotand does not mean Bluetooth, Blow was at these, uh, the Middle Ages just another name for dark. So Blowland was Africa, so Blotand was somehow a guy with a dark complexion and not blue teeth. But I think that's quite obvious. Okay, so stop this historical detour. What is Bluetooth today? Bluetooth today still has the historical system called the Bluetooth basic rate 
up to 700 and something kilobit per second, has optional higher data rates, that's called enhanced data rate, two megabit per second, an optional alternate Mac and Phi with 54 megabits per second. Well, that's basically a wireless LAN module integrated. So that's one setting. So one setting is that you say, okay, classical Bluetooth device, that's this one with only the basic rate and then we have enhanced data rate. We can add a wireless LAN component, so to say. That's one part of the story. And then with a complete different physical layer, there's Bluetooth low energy, giving you up to two megabit per second. The idea here is much lower power consumption, cheaper, less complexity, way more sleeping devices, and that's more for smart beacons for home automation. You can combine this. So for example, many devices of today, they combine a classical Bluetooth controller, basic rate, enhanced data rate, and a low energy controller. These are also two pieces of hardware, more or less. They share many protocols, but it's two pieces of hardware. So Bluetooth low energy is not the classical Bluetooth with a special sleep mode, for example. No, it's a completely different medium access scheme. It's a different physical layer. So it's not the same. So, uh, in the beginning, there were basically the designers had two different chips and both called somehow Bluetooth, same name, but different technology. And they share many of the higher layer protocols. If you wanna have a full featured device, then you have low energy Bluetooth, basic rate, enhanced data rate Bluetooth, and several other wireless LAN controllers. Okay, so let's go back to the classical Bluetooth system Bluetooth, the basic rate. Bluetooth also operates at the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, yep. But now, big difference, we have 79 channels. Not like wireless LAN, 13 channels or 12, uh, 11 channels. We have 79 and one megahertz carrier spacing. So that's different. Different modulation scheme, etc. So, big difference here to wireless LAN, more channels. Then we perform frequency hopping and use also time division duplex. Time division duplex, that's also in wireless LANs, but frequency hopping. So we hop in a pseudo random fashion and there's a master as we will learn and the master determines the hopping. Okay, so hopping, why? As we will learn, this spreads the signal over the spectrum in our ISM band and this mitigates our narrowband interference. So we just hop around in the spectrum and avoid interfering narrowband channels. So narrowband interference, well, great. Broadband, that's always a problem. Bluetooth offers two links. One is a synchronous connection oriented and one is an asynchronous connection less. So the SEO links, the connection oriented ones, they apply for the error correction and they are circuit switched 64 kilobit per second. So that's the classical voice PCM coded as we had them in the classical phone systems, ISDN, whatever. And then there's the asynchronous connectionless. That's can operate also point to multipoint. And there we can go up to 700 and something kilobit per second. Packet switched. Okay. What is also quite different, not only data rates, but also the topology when we compare with wireless LANs. Because now, and that's the term, we use piconets. Piconets are stars that may overlap different piconets. And many piconets can form a so-called scatternet. How does this work? Okay, first of all, a piconet. A piconet basically is a collection of devices and they are all connected in an ad hoc fashion. Okay, what is now this piconet? We have one unit acting as a master. This can be any device. This could be your laptop, this could be your mobile phone, whatever. There are many devices capable of being a master. 
So one unit is a master and all the others are the slaves, as long as the piconet lives. Now the interesting part is the master determines the hopping pattern and the slaves have to synchronize. So the master tells you how you hop through the spectrum and all the slaves have to synchronize to this pattern to be able to communicate with the master. Master determines, slaves they simply follow. And the trick now is that each piconet is basically defined by this unique hopping pattern. If the master leaves the piconet, there is no more piconet. So, and if you participate in the piconet, well, you have to synchronize to the hopping sequence. Without synchronization, well, you are maybe in standby mode and you're not participating in this piconet. As soon as you synchronize to the hopping pattern, a special sequence, the master will tell you the sequence, then you are part of the piconet. There's also upper limit of, yes, one master. There can be only one master because this master defines the piconet and up to a maximum of seven simultaneous slaves because we use only three bit addresses. And one address is used for broadcast and then this leaves seven addresses for the slaves. Okay, but how do we form a piconet? Let's assume we have uh, several devices here. They're all in standby mode and they're not synchronized. Okay, then to create a piconet, one of the devices says, I'm the master. So for example, you switch on the device and if there's no other network, the device will say, okay, I'm the master. That's it. And if another device wants to participate, so after this one is the master, if another device wants to participate, then this device has to adjust the internal clock. The hopping pattern itself is determined by the device ID of the master. So the master has an ID and the clock of the master determines the phase in the hopping pattern. So the device ID basically is used for a random number generator. This generator starts generating random hopping, the random hopping sequence, the channels. And if you want to join, you have to know this ID and where the hopping pattern is right now. So which channel, so the phase in the hopping pattern. And if you know the ID and the phase, then you can synchronize because you use the ID also to create the same random values of the channel and the phase that is the clock you use to be in phase with the hopping. Okay. And that means joining a piconet, synchronization. And then you can use a so-called logical transport address, a three-bit address to address the slaves. The interesting thing is, as we will learn, the three bits, that's fine. Because, as you see, communication is only possible from a slave to its master or from the master to the slave. In standard configuration, there's no communication between slaves. So the master controls the networks. So the master has its piconet controlling all the communication. So the three bit addresses, you can assign them to the slaves. This gives you seven slaves and one broadcast address. The master, well, the master does not need an address. Why should the master have an address? All the communication goes to the master or comes from the master. So if there's a data packet coming from the master, it needs only a destination address so that the right slave knows, okay, that's a packet for me. If slaves send a packet, well, they only need their source address. You don't need two addresses here. So very strict scheme. If you want to create a larger network, 
you can combine different networks. Combining networks, that means you link co-located piconets through the sharing of devices. So you can share a device, it can be a slave or a master, and this slave can jump back and forth between the piconets. If this device is a master and the master jumps out of its own piconet into another one, that means it synchronizes to another master, it will basically freeze the old piconet. Without the master, no one can do anything in the piconet. So the devices can jump back and forth and carry some data with it. That's the basic idea of creating a scatternet. To be honest, scatternets were never successful. That was an idea in Bluetooth, but most of the Bluetooth settings today, well, that's a master having some slaves. So your mobile phone and your headset, your keyboard, mouse, pen, and tablet, something like this. Now let's uh, have a look at the classical protocol stack. What was the idea? 1994 replacement of cables and infrared. So that means that you have some specialized Bluetooth protocols for the radio, the baseband, there's some adaptation protocols, there's service discovery, and a lot of other protocols helping you to adapt to well-known systems and applications. For example, business card, calendar entries, exchange, there are certain protocols have to be supported. Or the classical AT commands for modems supported, telephony support, or here the classical internet protocols. It should be a replacement for also serial adapters. So that's still the most simplest way of connecting devices, a serial line interface, but now using Bluetooth over the air. This picture should just show you, okay, Bluetooth needs some new protocols, layers, physical layer, Mac layer, and some adaptations to other protocols. Audio is always a special case, very low latency that's uh, needed uh, and you don't use these kind of overheads from other protocols. Okay, so Bluetooth has somehow to integrate into the existing systems. The standard will give you many more examples of how this is done, how you exchange, for example, telephony, control information, etc etc now the interesting part and i also only want to highlight the differences to wireless lands yeah we all have protocols but what are differences and that also reflects some of the key ideas of bluetooth contrasting it to wireless lands and one idea was hopping hopping 1600 times per second that means there's a certain dwell time, so of 625 microseconds. That means how long do you stay on a certain frequency? Now, Bluetooth does it in the following way. Usually, there's the master, which controls the piconet, sending on a certain frequency, and then one of the slaves answers on the next frequency. So, 625 microseconds on FK, and then you hop onto a different frequency and then again the master and then a slave, then a master and a slave. So this is this kind of ping pong master, slave, master, slave and the master pulls the slaves if the slaves have data to transmit. That's one way of doing it. If the master wants to transmit more data, the master can stay on a certain frequency for three slots and then again it's the turn of a slave but and that's the interesting part you see for the frequency now it's fk plus three 
you do not continue with the next frequency in the old hopping pattern. And the reason for this is quite simple. All devices that are part of the PicoNet that are synchronized, they perform the hopping all the time. So if now the master transmits to a slave some more data, and then the other slaves, they would not recognize this if they used now uh, their FK plus three, and only this slave, the master is communicating maybe with this slave, now uses the next frequency, well, this is chaos. So the idea there is that all the systems, they simply stay with the hopping pattern, no matter how long, in this case, the master occupies the medium. And it's allowed and specified in Bluetooth to occupy for three or for five slots. Just think a second, why not two or four? Think of this pattern, master, slave, master, slave, master, slave. And all the slaves are synced to this pattern. So two or four, again, chaos. The master can also allow a slave to occupy the medium a bit longer. In this example, shown five slots. Again, you see the frequencies here. So all the devices still internally perform this hopping and then they continue with the frequency of K plus six. That's the idea. If you occupy more slots, that means higher data rates. I will come back to this in a second. Okay, so that clearly is a difference to wireless LANs. This type of selecting a frequency, hopping, avoiding narrowband interference. What else do we have? Well, baseband, so the lowest layers defines our channels, our piconets, but also packets. Packets, they contain an access code, so that's exactly what we need for the physical channel access. So there's the uh, derived from the master, a channel, there's a certain code, a preamble, synchronization. That's just pure physical reasons that we have to synchronize. Then we have a header, so-called logical transport identifier. That's an address. That's our three bit address, as you see here, three bit address packet types, flow control, very, very simple. Just one bit of acknowledgement, sequence, numbers. It's an alternating bit protocol, very simple one. And this is efficient because we have this master-slave, master-slave pattern. It's a half duplex system anyway. It, the devices are very close to each other and you learn from computer networks, well, alternating bit protocols, not that efficient, but here they are efficient because of this half duplex master-slave scheme being closed together, all the devices, so we don't have the issues of uh, we need sliding windows, etc. So very simple scheme here. Okay, that's our header and a header error control. That means a checksum. And you see, okay, this header, 54 bits. If you add the bits here, it's not 54. You repeat the header. So yeah, it, this is protected by an FEC. Um, so that's the idea. For the enhanced data rates, there's an additional sync field for higher data rates, switching the modulation from Gaussian frequency shift keying to DPSK, differential phase shift keying, and then there's the payload. Just to give you an impression of the packet at the lowest layer and inside the payload, now this depends on uh, the packet type. Please do not learn the payloads just to show you how this works. Uh, we can transmit, for example, in the SEO, that's the connection oriented. Uh, we can send audio with a lot of redundancy to protect against interference or less redundancy. Here, if there's almost no interference, so if we have a lot of redundancy, we have to send more packets to get the same throughput compared to 
low or no redundancy. So that's uh, just one example that's used for audio. And then there are many more examples for the connectionless. Connectionless where you have uh, certain headers and different types of payloads. And here you see you can combine slots. Only one slot, three slots or five slots. So what does it mean? The packets themselves and the structure is not important. For the user, this is important. Oh, quite many packets. But the user, for example, what do we have? For the classical Bluetooth, a maximum data rate of 723.2 kilobit per second. And the link, for example, from your laptop to your whatever mobile phone and 57 in the reverse direction, that's asymmetric, or maximum of 433.9 if it's symmetric. That's the classical basic rate. And if you have enhanced data rate and you combine five slots, that's maximum you can uh, do, then you see you will reach this, well, up to two megabit per second. For SCO, that's used for voice, for example, the classical data rates are these 64 kilobit per second. That's our PCM coding, classical ISDN telephones. And depending on the interference, you have more or less for the correction. And then there are some more uh, data rates available. Okay, so that was the introduction to Bluetooth. And in the very beginning, what were the goals of Bluetooth? And if you look today on Bluetooth, maybe there are some different, some enhanced goals. So what is really the difference or what are the differences between a wireless LAN and Bluetooth on a high level? Yes, some, there are many, many details, but from a high level perspective. There's something special in Bluetooth, so-called PicoNet. What is a PicoNet? I haven't talked about collision. Well, inside the PicoNet, there's no collision. Why? Well, how can still collisions occur? Well, collisions caused by Bluetooth, yes. No, caused by something else. Can we have collisions in a PicoNet? And then if you look at the higher data rates, the EDR mode, how does EDR achieve higher data rates? 